Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So our gospel reading, that of the feeding of the 5,000, is probably one of the better known events in the gospels. It's in all of our children's Bible story books, and we've learned it very well, I would say, from our own youth. From it, we have learned to reinforce, or if we not reinforcing, at least we learn some understanding of, of particular doctrines. As an example, from it, we learn that Jesus has omnipotence, that he's all-powerful, that he does what just doesn't naturally happen in the world where he can turn five loaves and two fish into a meal for 5,000 men, plus all the additional women and children. We see a pattern here also for the ordained. Those who would, by Jesus' command, distribute among the people the bread of heaven. And so we can see the feeding here also. In this 5,000, the feeding also for, that had been foreshadowed in the wilderness as God provided manna from heaven and daily provided for the needs of his people Israel in the wilderness. But then also a precursor, a precursor to that heavenly meal where all the saints shall be fed by God's daily provision. And that banquet that shall exist in eternity. Though in our text here there are few words, just one short sentence that speaks of the compassion of Jesus as he heals the crowd and then feeds them. It is the overarching theme through this, this portion of the text. The compassion of Jesus that he does for the people, what they cannot do for themselves. With all of this in mind, I think there's so many different directions a preacher could go. But I want to focus here, particularly thinking back on the last couple of weeks, as we have read, where we have, in chapter 13, um, read parables of Jesus, parables where he teaches Chapter 13, at the beginning there, the parable of the weeds or the wheat and the tares, uh, however you might name it, that where we know that the grain grows up, but right along with it, the weeds grow up, and you can't really tell the two apart until it's time for the harvest. And then also, the, the parable of the treasure in the field last week, and the treasure of, or the pearl of great price whereby we see that God, knowing full well the cost, deems it very much worthwhile to give up all things, that he might purchase us, you, the church. And he does not hesitate to buy and, and do all that is necessary. preach on that, the text, uh, that, the parable that followed those, that of the, the great catch. But there we do see that in that great catch, there does come a day of sorting. And we are given the assurance, though the wheat and the tares grow together, and that both the wicked and the righteous exist together, there does come a day of reckoning. What we didn't, though, is we skipped a couple of portions, the end of chapter 13 and the beginning of chapter 14 in between these today's reading and the last two weeks. The end of chapter 13 is after Jesus teaches these parables, he goes back to Nazareth, right, where he grew up. And there, they don't want to listen to him, and they reject him. And then at the beginning of chapter 14 here, this is where Matthew inserts the account of Herod um, executing John the Baptist. And um, in our reading today, the actual text just says, because of this, Jesus went to a desolate place. But we had in brackets, because of the death of John the Baptist. So we see here, 
the, the, what's playing into this feeding of the 5,000. The teaching in parables on what the kingdom of heaven is like. The death of John the Baptist at Herod's birthday party. And then Jesus going to this desolate place and feeding the 5,000. In this progression, in particular, I'm going to say, in the contrast between the banquet that Herod has and here the banquet that Jesus has, we do see the contrast of kingdoms. The kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God, that kingdom of heaven. So King Herod holds a banquet, and he does so so that he can celebrate his own birthday. Right? We normally don't have birthday parties for ourselves, but King Herod does. He invites important people and he provides for them entertainment. Because he's pleased by his niece's performance then at in her dancing, he makes what I will say is a frivolous promise. A promise to give her up to half of his kingdom. And seeking, though, wisdom, some counsel from her mother, she doesn't ask for all kinds of riches. She asks for the head of John the Baptist. Now, while King Herod might be saved half of his kingdom in this, he does regret that he ever made that promise as he follows through with the execution of John. See, Herod was a, a proud king, a king demonstrating his reign in an opulent fashion. It's showmanship, right? He he's, has a showy kingdom from, from a palace to the food that he serves, to, to the guests that he invites and the entertainment that he provides. Herod tried to display in all of these things his power, the power that he has, we might say, over others. And chiefly is demonstrated when he commands that John be separated from his head. But this palace in which he reigns or lives is the one that was built by his grandfather, Herod the Great. It was overshadowed by only one building in all of Jerusalem, and that was the temple. It sits very prominently and very large up on a hill for all to see. It was massive. He was able to provide there a never-ending supply of all the, the finest of the meats and the dairy, the nuts and the fruits that the, that the land itself could supply. You know, we might say in his pantry there wasn't a slice of day-old bread. He had the power to set a table that very few in the land could match. The guests at his party were the movers and the shakers of his day, the elite, the moneyed. They fed his ego and his sense of being in control. Not only did he flaunt his relationship with his brother's wife, but he displayed her daughter here before his guests. But all of that pales in comparison, I would say, to the frivolous nature of his promise. He promised up to half of his kingdom as if giving up half of all that he had would not affect him in the least. He implied that such would be an enormous gift, yes, for this girl, more than she would ever have otherwise, but it would have no impact upon his own status and his own control. It would not diminish his power. In all that he did, Herod worked to show that he sits on top of the world. In the end, we see that it was quite op the opposite. It was a small girl who held power over Herod, that he might do her bid. And so it had been throughout history that it is by the pride of kings that the prophets die. But the banquet that is hosted by Jesus is quite different. Here there is no palace. There's not enough food for everybody. 
The guests themselves, they're not the powerful. They're the downcast, the outcast. There is no entertainment provided. It's a very different scene in which here the reign of God is demonstrated. Real power doesn't need showiness. Real power produces results. Jesus had no inner palace chambers to which he could retreat and to, to find rest or, rest or recluse. Even when seeking solitude, though, in this world, there was none found for the Son of Man. He had no ballroom in which to entertain, but he does lead all to those green pastures where they would find their fill. These guests had no invitation, but they came following, looking for, seeking after the one that they knew that could provide their ultimate needs as he sought retreat across the, the water. They didn't come because they were able to elevate Jesus and, and to somehow lift up his status. They came out of great need because of their own sickness. They were not there to offer anything, but to seek after something. When it had come time for the meal, only five loaves and two fish were to be found. But what is that among so many? It's not going to feed even the twelve, I would say. But in the kingdom of God, it is enough. It satisfies. It provides for all who come. Jesus does not offer entertainment to distract the masses to help them just simply forget their troubles. Instead, he heals the sick. He casts out the demons. He solves their problems and their troubles. Jesus shows that in his kingdom, power exists to mend and to heal, to restore and to make whole, to reconcile, through the forgiveness of sins, and to bring peace. This kingdom, too, would have the death of its prophet, not because it was taken from him, but only because he willingly laid down his life. Earthly kings, they may have temporal power, power to take the lives of the prophets and the others, but it is only the king of kings that has the power to take life up again and to have victory over death. We see here a contrast between the kingdoms of men and the kingdom of God. It is a contrast of showmanship and posturing to, in order to intimidate versus humility doing that which is necessary for peace. The kingdom of heaven is manifest in the provision that is sufficient for the day and in the hearts of those that trust in that daily provision. The kingdom of heaven comes in the word that heals, the word that restores, that word that reconciles and forgives. The kingdom of heaven is present in the one who gives his flesh as the bread for the life of the world. In the first paragraph, I mentioned the connection of this miraculous feeding, the feeding of the 5,000, to the feeding of the children of Israel in the desert, as well as to the feeding of the saints in heaven. So too, though, are we to see a broad connection, a connection to the present reigning of Jesus in his kingdom and the present feeding of his saints around his altar. We should see the contrast between earthly kingdoms that come and go and the heavenly kingdom that is eternal. How the one is all for show and how the one that does exist throughout eternity the one in which you are a part and participate in, brings and offers true peace. 
Yes, the weeds, they keep growing and spreading. Sometimes it seems there's more weeds than there is wheat in the field. Sometimes it seems as if the net itself, as it catches that great cash head, has fewer and fewer good fish. While the kings of this world, they make ridiculous claims. Jesus continues to invite us, though, to sit upon the grass, to be satisfied at his word through the action of his church, the commissioning of his saints to do his will, that is to be filled through his means of grace. The feeding of the 5,000, while a singular event in the scripture, is not just this one-off event. It is an event to depict the reality of life in the church. To depict what it is life under the reign of the eternal king looks like. Life that is satisfied in the one who has given his life so that you may have life abundant. This he gives to you as he feeds you this day in word and in sacrament by his means of grace, granting to you the forgiveness of sins won in his own name by his actions. Because there he feeds you for now, today, and for eternity. So may that peace which does pass all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.